All right, welcome to today's Real Health webinar. Uh, this is Dr. Taylor, and I'm really excited to bring you today's topic. You know, I say that every time, but unlike some of the webinars that we've done in the past, covering really important topics, but things like autoimmune disease, thyroid disease, gut health, you know, those are pretty niche health topics, and they are really, really important today. But this is a topic that really is important to every single person. Uh, it controls your aging, it controls your inflammation, and it's something that we all know and we all have had measured when we go in for a physical, and that is the topic of blood sugar, okay? Controlling your blood sugar. So I'm gonna pull up my slideshow here. Let's make sure that we have everything perfect. Okay, so the reason that this is so important is because poor blood sugar control really leads to everything, okay? So weight gain, that's becoming more and more known today. We know that insulin, which we're gonna talk about, is the fat-producing hormone, okay? So it's not fat that makes you fat, it is sugar that makes you fat. And more and more people know that today. It obviously leads to diabetes, okay? That's the third leading killer in our country. Um, chronic disease on the rise, the fastest growing. You know, it's growing in our kids, it's growing in, in everybody as far as uh, how many people are being diagnosed with diabetes. Takes an average of eight years off your life. Uh, it is completely preventable. Okay, so poor blood sugar control leads to inflammation, okay? Cellular inflammation, arterial inflammation. That's why we see next high blood pressure, high LDL, high triglycerides. Those all rise together with blood sugar. It also leads to faster aging, okay? So controlling your blood sugar is the number one thing you can do to control the rate at which you age. And like we just mentioned, leads to an earlier death uh, and metabolic syndrome. Okay, metabolic syndrome is basically metabolic disease, obesity, uh, hypertension, diabetes, kind of a combination of several different things here. But I put there regardless of weight because I think that that's a pretty important uh, topic because you know we think of hyper high, uh, blood sugar too high hyperglycemia but hypoglycemia is an equal risk factor for diabetes and the really really interesting thing about this regardless of weight I said you know you can be uh, skinny fat okay you can be thin and you can have fatty liver disease you can be thin and you can eat all the candy in the world and things like that and you don't gain weight the same way as you know your your family and your neighbors and things but at the same time you're still developing metabolic disease and here's a really interesting fact that I want to share with you is that there are more sick metabolically sick non obese people okay so there's obese and non obese right and, and so in our country there's 240 million adults, okay, and 30% and of those adults are obese. So that's 72 million obese Americans, okay? 80% of obese people, people that, that are uh, not overweight but obese, have metabolic disease. So that makes 57 million metabolically sick obese Americans. Now, there are 168 million non-obese adults, okay, and 40% of them have metabolic disease, that equals 67 million metabolically sick non-obese Americans, which is crazy because that means that there are more sick, metabolically sick non-obese people than there are obese. So this has nothing to do with weight. I just threw that slide in there to, to show you that it, it really has nothing to do with weight, even though poor blood sugar control will cause you to gain weight okay uh, so how do you know you know th like I said this is something that most people ha have had tested they've been in for their physical or you know they've got life insurance or even kids you know they've had this tested to see where they're at and so that's how you know it's really easy it's really cheap it's really standard so they've done you know hundreds of billions it, you know, I don't know more than that blood sugar tests in the past, and they were able to actually compile this data. I actually heard uh, an MD speaking recently, and this was uh, amazing. He said, you know, obviously there's no guarantees, but he said we could take somebody in their 30s or their 40s or their 50s, and based on their blood sugar, where their blood sugar is at, we could fairly accurately 
predict how long they're gonna live. Like for example, if you're 30 years old and your blood sugar is you know, 80 in the morning, you're likely to live into your 90s. If your blood sugar is 90 in the morning, you might live in, into your 80s, late 70s. If your blood sugar is over 100, which is pre-diabetic, then you're less likely to live that long. And I'm just ballparking those numbers, but he lists them actually pretty specifically. Uh, and it was very cool to hear. But once again, it is ballpark numbers. So when we look at this, how do you know? So blood test levels. When you get your blood tested, how do you know? So normal, a few things that they're going to test are going to be like, let's look first at your fasting plasma glucose here. Okay, so that is uh, your blood sugar in the morning. Okay, so if you are below 100 in the morning, you are in the normal range, according to the standard medical system. Now, if you're close to 100 in the high 90s, I'd say that that's you know cause for concern. But then pre-diabetes, pre-diabetes is anything 100 to 125. Okay, and some people I've heard to consider 100 to 110, uh, but that's pre-diabetes, and then diabetes 126 or above. Okay, another one they do on the right there is the oral glucose tolerance test if you are 139 or below and that's when they, they feed you some sugar and they test it okay so at, at, if you're 139 or below you're normal 140 to 199 pre-diabetic or 200 and above is diabetic but then the other one here is called the a1c the hb a1c okay that's an average of your blood sugar over the past 90 days so this is a really interesting statistic uh, because a1c is a measure of what's called glycation. And when I said that um, blood sugar leads to, to faster aging, um, this is one of the ways why. So glycation is something that when your skin gets wrinkles, when your discs in your spine or your cartilage in your knee degenerate, when those things begin to break down, that is a process called glycation. Okay, I have a, an article on my blog that, that, that's called Sugar Ages Your Body Faster. And the ages is an acronym. It's called Advanced Glycation End Products and how sugar ages your body. So this is a really important number here. So normal, about 5, pre-diabetic, 5.7 to 6.4, diabetic 6.5 or above. And this is a number that I really love when my patients come in and they say, oh gosh, my, my uh, A1C went from 5.9 to 5.2. Like, oh wow, that is amazing. My A1C went from, more, more, more commonly I would say, my A1C went from 6.9 to 5.9. You know, going from diabetic to pre-diabetic or going from pre-diabetic down to normal. I love to hear those things. So what are these, you know, a measure of and why is it such a concern? And if I don't get my face pulled back up here, I'm just going to keep going with the slides because something is going wrong with my camera. Okay, I'm going to keep going with my slides. Um, so what are, what are we measuring here? You know, we're measuring the actual blood sugar. And, and so what, what does that mean? So when you eat a food that has sugars in it, that sugar is in your bloodstream. Okay, so after it breaks down, it immediately goes into your bloodstream. Now, we may have heard of the hormone insulin, okay? Insulin is what transports sugar out of your bloodstream into your cells. Okay, you do not want too much sugar in your bloodstream. It can actually be fatal, uh, so you, you need to get it out of there. So insulin will take that blood sugar, transport it from the bloodstream, and take it out into the cells. Okay, so as your blood sugar increases, your insulin increases too. We're going to go through, I'm going to show you a few charts of that and things, but I, you know, I, I like metaphors. If you've tuned into our other webinars, I think that metaphors do a great job of really explaining how this happens. Okay, and so when, it, when sugar gets stored in the cells, it's stored as energy, right? Because when you eat, that is energy. Your food is energy. The carbs and the sugars are energy. Your body can really use those. We've used the metaphor before of, you know, carbs are a very quick source of fuel. They're like throwing kindling on a fire. Carbs and sugars, they burn quickly, but they go out quickly. Whereas fat is more like a big log on the fire. But anyway, you are 
uh, taking in this energy, this quick energy, and your body wants to store it. It wants to store it for later because it doesn't need all of it right then. Okay, so the analogy that I want to use is the analogy of the bank. Okay, so imagine that you make, you know, a, a lot of money and add, more than you need. Okay, and that's what sugar is. You know, you're eating more than you need. Okay, so you're eating more energy than you need, so you have an energy surplus. So your body wants to store that. Well, because it wants to use it later, right? Uh, so what happens, though, is as your body begins to store sugar, as insulin takes sugar and puts it in the bank and says, here you go, I'm going to need this later. It stores it, and, and you keep taking it more than you need. You keep storing it. We're going to need it later. We're going to need it later. We're going to need it later. But then when you don't eat for a little bit, like let's say you know you eat uh, a lunch or you miss lunch. Let's say you miss lunch around 1 or 2 in the afternoon. Most people, they're going to get really cranky. They're going to get really tired. Their body, their blood sugar drops back down. The body says, hey, we need more. Okay, And that's like going to the bank to try to get more money. Like you know you've stored some for energy. You can see it around your waistline. You know you've stored this as fat because that's what sugar gets stored as is it gets stored as fat. Okay, so you go to access that and your body can't access the fat. Okay, so now how, how, how are you going to feel when you see this sign pop up? You know, you go to access your funds that you have responsibly stored away and you can't get to them. You're going to get hangry, okay? That's what happens when you get hangry. Your blood sugar dips. Your body needs more energy. But here's the thing is our bodies aren't trained to access our fat stores. We can't get to them because we feed ourselves too much sugar, okay? And, and I'm a huge advocate of something called the ketogenic diet where ketosis, ketogenic, is when you've trained your body to be a fat burner rather than a sugar burner. So we take our, our sugar to the bank, we store it as fat, okay? And insulin would be like maybe the armed guard that, that takes your money and stores it, right? It's going to take it and put it away. But then it gets stored as fat. Most of us, most Americans, have plenty of, of fat stored on our bodies, right, for, for excess energy. You know, I always use the analogy of if you put somebody on a deserted island, they're not going to die. They have plenty of energy that's stored as fat. So, so why can't they burn it? Well, their funds have been denied. Okay, and so that is why, you know, we don't lose weight because all of our sugar has been stored as fat. So you have to learn how to control your blood sugar and learn how to um, you access your fat stores. So this is what happens, you know, as we eat throughout the day. Uh, here, here's breakfast. So, you know, you eat and your blood sugar goes up. As your blood sugar goes up, your insulin goes up. Okay, insulin takes it to the bank, then blood sugar goes down. All of a sudden, your wallet is empty. You, you keep going. Uh, and, and then you're like, oh, crap, I need to make more money. Okay, so that's excess insulin triggers a sugar craving. Now, the problem is with this chart here is that if this was everybody, breakfast, your insulin and blood sugar go up, lunch, your insulin and blood sugar go up, dinner, your insulin and blood sugar go up, and they come back down, that would be fine. But what happens today in our chronically overfed state is that at the end of the day, insulin here goes up and stays up because you've eaten, you know, most people's not breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it's snacks in between. We're chronically overfeeding ourselves. We're chronically spiking blood sugar, chronically spiking insulin, and it actually stays up throughout the night uh, as you, you know, go to sleep. And then you wake up the next morning and your blood sugar is high again. Your cortisol is high. Your fat storage hormone is really, really high there. So this is how it happens. You know, you get uh, you eat carbs, let's start there, you get high blood sugar, insulin gets released, it takes the carbs and stores them as body fat, then your blood sugar goes back down, you get a craving, and then you eat more carbs, right? So what you have to do is you have to break the carb addiction cycle, 
Okay, and this is a, an easy thing to do. I shouldn't say easy. It's it's simple. Uh, easy makes it sound like it's it's easy to do. It's not. You're gonna have cravings. It's you know breaking a sugar addiction oftentimes, which is not easy, but it is very simple. So what I'm gonna give you today are five action steps to break the carb addiction cycle, to get your blood sugar under control, and to really control you know your inflammation, your aging, and your risk of of chronic disease. You know, for me, I'm I'm, I'm 30. I'm in my 30s. 31 actually. Um, so right now my, my blood sugar is fine, but I'm trying to live to 100. Okay. Um, and so I, I watch it now. And I did a talk recently and, and the woman asked, she said, well, what about my grandkids? Like they just eat so much sugar and then they're hungry again and hungry again, but they don't put on any weight. And I, and I use the example of, you know, our, our grandparents, my grandparents, you know, my generation, but that their generation got sick in their 60s and 70s, maybe. Okay, now my parents' generation right now, they're getting sick in their 50s. And, and now what we're seeing today is people getting sick into their 30s and even into their 20s. And like I said, diabetes is fastly rising in our kids. It's incredible the stats on, on how quickly diabetes is rising in our kids. So yeah, they don't put on fat when they're you know eight years old, but you're absolutely leading them down a path of chronic disease. So you have to stop this cycle. You have to learn how to control your blood sugar. And I'm going to give you five easy action steps for this. Okay, so here are the five action steps. Number one is read your labels. Okay, I'm going to give you some examples of that. You got to be able to learn to read your labels. That's important for everything. But you have to know where sugar is coming from. You have to know how to count it. You have to know some some baselines to compare it to. Uh, number two is eliminate any added sugars, and then even things like high sugar things like limit your intake of fruits, grains, etc. Like I'm a I'm a huge huge. Uh, hater of fruit juice. Okay, even for my kids, my kids never drink fruit juice. Even if we juice it ourselves, that's a little bit of a different story. I'm a really big hater if it's been pasteurized, it kills a lot of the nutrition, and you're basically drinking a lot of sugar water. Uh, grains too. We're gonna, we'll talk about that. Uh, number three, understand glycemic index versus glycemic load, and I will explain that, of course. But that's an important thing to understand so that once again, you know, just it's like taking number two, step number two, and going a step further. Okay. And each one of these, I'd say, is, you know, you got to start with number one, then do number two, then number three, then number four, which is measure, measure, measure. Okay. And that includes things like measure how many carbs you're eating in the day uh, or measure your blood sugar. It's really, really easy. I wish my camera was working because I'd show you my blood sugar meter sitting right here. But um, that's something that I do fairly often. But you can also measure your carbs for the day. And then number five is eat less often. Okay, you don't need to eat less. You need to eat less often. That includes things like fasting, intermittent fasting. Uh, but we'll get into that when we get down to number five there. So number one, read your labels okay so if you see here here's a nutrition facts we've all seen it uh, but the picture on the right is maybe how we should label our food right that's a, a sugar display there so you see a red bull 27 grams of sugar and you see how much white sh bag sugar that is you know we've done sugar displays in the office a little packet of sugar like you might see at McDonald's um, it is 3.5 grams okay so that's about what eight, seven, seven of those. I, my math isn't too quick on that, but, uh, you know, six and a half to seven white packets of sugar in a Red Bull. Now, then look at the orange juice. Okay, Red Bull, we're like, oh my gosh, you know, it's a, uh, it's caffeine. It's, it's getting kids all wired up. We'll look next to it at the Gatorade in the orange juice. That's absurd. Uh, 41 grams. So that'd be over 10, you know, 12, probably 12 of those white packets in each of those. In an orange juice, we might grab, thinking we're getting a healthy breakfast. Well, right away, first thing in the morning, you are spiking your blood sugar, you are spiking your insulin. And if you think it's gonna come down for the rest of the day, uh, chances are slim, because when it does come down, that's when you hit your 10 o'clock wall where you need a snack to get to lunch, 
uh, yeah. And so on the end, pomegranate juice, that, you know, if, if we listed these five here and said to every American, said list these in order of, of healthiest to least healthy, they'd probably put the pomegranate juice as the healthiest. 62 grams of sugar in that thing. That is absurd. Okay, but the nutrition fact on the left, that's what we really see, right? So it, I don't know what this is, but 95 calories here, no fat, uh, carbs, 23.5 grams, uh, half a gram of fiber. I think it's a kid's pouch because uh, it says one pouch, and my kids uh, do eat these sometimes, like or organic fruit pouches. But man, I need to look at the label now. But 23 grams of sugar in one pouch there. Okay, um, and so you have to learn how to read your labels. You have to know what you're looking at. The nutrition facts will tell you quickly. Okay, so that's step one is learn how to read the nutrition facts like this picture. But I am a huge, huge advocate of learning how to read your ingredients. Okay, because this is important. But then look at the ingredients. Because, for example, talking about glycation, uh, high fructose corn syrup glycates considerably faster than you know eating an apple or or you know even apple juice or several other forms of sugar. So there are better and worse forms of sugar. But when you look on your label, here's some things that you might find. Here's 43 different names for added sugar. I'm not going to go through all these. You can pause the webinar if you want to write them down, or you can Google. Google image this, uh, but you know, agave nectar, that's no good. Uh, you know, for a while there it was thought of as a, as a health food, but that did not last very long. But here's some other things that you might see often, you know, sucrose, high fructose corn syrup. Is that even on here? Yeah, number 24. Um, let's see, are some others that you see often. There's regular corn syrup, date sugar, fruit juice, fructose, evaporated cane juice. You know, they're, they're gonna put a name on it that makes it sound a little bit healthier than just putting sugar or high fructose corn syrup because that's gotten such a bad rap. So you need to learn how to read your ingredients labels. Uh, here's another example, and you might be shocked of this, but a ketchup, a regular non-organic Heinz ketchup has that much sugar in it, okay, 132 grams of sugar in it. Um, but then on the other side, the naked juice has 60 grams. Okay, so twice as much sugar in the ketchup. But one thing that I really want to point out with this that you have to you have to take into consideration when you're reading your labels, uh, how often are you going to eat that whole bottle of ketchup? You know, I mean, I, I think it's safe to say never, right? Uh, and it might take you, you know, ketchup might last in your fridge several months, okay? And there are lower sugar options, first off, than the standard Heinz tomato ketchup. But still, that might last you a long time. You're getting maybe four grams. You're literally getting you know, a serving each time, 33 serving. That naked juice, for most people, is going to be gone in 10 minutes. Okay, so that's 30 grams of sugar times two servings. Right away, you're jumping your sugar uh, immediately. So that's why I hate fruit juices. Here's another reason. Uh, oh, no, this is number two. So, you know, limit fruit and, and, and added sugars. Um, and, you know, here, look at again at the uh, ingredients label. Here is orange juice pasteurized. So, like I said, it kills a lot of the nutrition. A full day supply of vitamin C. You know, vitamin C is killed by heat. So, I would argue that. Um, you know, and, and like to use the easy example of chocolate or cacao is one of the highest vitamin C foods on the planet. But when it's heated and made into chocolate, it kills all the vitamin C. But you look down here, 23 grams of sugar uh, times seven. So, you know, almost, almost 200 grams of sugar, 175, 100, uh, a little bit less than 175 grams of sugar. And, and total carbs, 170, 180 grams of carbs in one big thing of orange juice here. But you might think that you know, you're avoiding candy, you're avoiding ice cream, you're avoiding these these really high sugar foods that are really, really obvious. How about soda, a horrible, horrible one? Well, let's look at this. You know, this is a study that somebody else did on themselves. I haven't done this on myself because I just, I don't, quite frankly, don't want to. Uh, but this came from, you know, also it's mentioned in a book called Wheat Belly, uh, where they talk about wheat bread versus a Coke. And so this guy, Scott Milford, on his website, quittingsugar.com, did a test, okay? And the red line there, 
that's his blood sugar spike when he drank a full sugar Coca-Cola. Okay, so that's crazy. Uh, the, the, the blue line, though, is a wheat bread, a piece of wheat bread. Okay, and the spike makes a big difference. You do not want the spike. We're going to go into that with the next one, um, how to limit that, that spike in blood sugar. But wheat bread actually causes your blood sugar to spike more than a full sugar Coke. How many of you know that? How many people out there know that? Not very many. So it's really, really important. So you want to eliminate any added sugars. Okay, so you can look on your ingredients label. If I go back, it's uh, all those names. They're added sugars. You know, if it comes from an apple, it's not on there, right? Because apple doesn't have, an apple might be on there, but the sugar's not. It's natural fruit sugars. That's a completely different story. Um, but limit your fruit. We're going to talk about the glycemic index next. So you'll see like which fruits to, to limit. But I keep it, you know, to, to berries and Granny Smith apples. I have three apple trees in my yard, so I do eat apples occasionally in the summer when I'm not on a ketogenic diet. Um, but other than that, I really limit my fruit intake. And not to say that fruit is bad. I think that most of us know better than to say that fruit is bad. Uh, but when you live in the standard American diet and, and when you have the past that I have, you know, it's not, not, not horrible, but, you know, growing up was just the typical American lifestyle, you know, soda and candy were, there was no limit. You know, if it was around, I had it. My parents didn't, didn't buy a ton of it, but if I was at a friend's house or if I, you know, had a dollar or something, I could buy whatever I wanted and I sure did. And I love Skittles and I love Mountain Dew and, I, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, probably make me really, really sick now, but Twizzlers, Starburst, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not a, I'm not an ice cream, I'm not a bread or pasta person, I am a candy person. I, my dad's a dentist, he, he hates to hear me say that, but yeah, I was absolutely a candy kid. Um, and grains, okay, so limiting your grains, because grains turn to sugar, just like this wheat bread example, white rice, white bread, white pasta, spike it immediately, even whole wheat bread, whole wheat rice, whole brown rice, whole wheat pasta is going to spike it considerably. So I do not, I mean, I barely, I don't really touch grains. Um, occasionally, my girls will have something like quinoa or brown rice. Um, but yeah, we just don't do a lot of grains because of their effect on blood sugar and inflammation. Okay, so eliminate those things from your diet. Number three, then, is understanding the glycemic index versus the glycemic load, okay? And I'm going to explain that. The glycemic index gets considerably more publicity, okay? And so you hear people say, well, I don't eat, I don't eat carrots, I don't eat this, because they're high glycemic, okay? And so look at this, uh, this chart here. Some of the, the lower ones are on top. So snacks. Let's look down to pretzels, you know, 83, jelly beans, donuts, soda. What that is a measure of, I'll show you this real quickly and then we'll come back. It's a measure of how much your blood sugar spikes. You just look at that. The high GI foods raise blood sugar quickly. Okay, so that's that red, red graph there. It spikes. It's a huge spike when they're high glycemic. It's how quickly they turn to sugar in your body. Whereas the low GI foods are the orange line there, right? Okay, so I'll go back to the chart in a second here, but higher on the chart means the bigger blood sugar spike. Bigger blood sugar spike means bad news, okay? And, and, and you see where within 30 minutes, blood sugar falls. Notice it falls below where it started. When it falls below normal levels, foggy thinking, tiredness, and depression can occur. Okay, so you don't want high glycemic foods. You want to eat low glycemic foods. You don't want a blood sugar spike. So this is um, the, the, so, some of the examples here. So pizza, I'm pretty shocked. I, I mean, what pizza, you know, is 33, the, the same as, uh, you know, less than green peas. But I, want, I, I do want to explain the difference between index versus low before I get too far into that. But so look at this. You know, white spaghetti, 38, potato, that's a, a known as a high glycemic vegetable. Potatoes and carrots get a bad rap as being very high glycemic. Now, I will mention, since we're on this slide, when you soak potatoes, this is something that I learned from uh, uh, 
uh, Dr. Alan Christensen, an, an adrenal expert, um, and, and, and when you soak potatoes, they actually become more resistant starches, and they actually become one of the lowest glycemic foods. So baked potato, you see at the bottom there, it has a higher glycemic index than a donut, okay? Uh, but when you soak it, it's completely different. Let's look at some of the vegetables. Carrots, I wanna use carrots a, as my example. Carrots are known as a fairly high glycemic vegetable, okay? But understanding the glycemic index versus the glycemic load is really, really important. Glycemic index is, is uh, you know, controlled for weight, okay? So all these numbers that you see on here, I forget what the exact weight is, but let's say if you ate a gram of pizza, it would, rate, it would be a 33. If you ate a gram of donut, it would be a 76. If you ate a gram of, let me get my thing here, gram of carrots, 49. So a gram of beets is worse than a gram of carrots. A gram of onions is considerably worse. But let's compare those two, uh, onions and carrots. You know, how often do you eat the same amount of onions that you eat carrots? Okay, and let's actually compare this how often do you eat the same amount of carrots, gram-wise, that you eat donuts? Okay, and that's the difference between glycemic index and glycemic load. Donuts, when you eat, you know, two or three of them, you're getting a considerably more just amount of sugar. Like if we go back to the uh, uh, label here, the grams down here, that's closer to looking at the glycemic load. It's the, it's the amount of sugar and the glycemic index kind of combined. How quickly they spike your blood sugar, but how much of them you eat. To say that, you know, carrots are, you know, less healthy or about the same as popcorn, I would say is insane or the same as a chocolate bar. You know, that, that's the difference between glycemic index and glycemic load. When you're eating carrots, a high fiber food, it's completely different story. So I, I think it's important to, to have a grasp of the glycemic index. I'm really giving you a, a kindergarten version of it here. One of the best books and, and programs that I can recommend on this is uh, JJ Virgin's book. Uh, you can look up her name, JJ, the first name JJ, last name Virgin. Um, and, and she has a great book and a great program, something that my, my mom has gone through and, and something that you know, I just highly recommend to really understand the difference between glycemic index and glycemic load. But when you look at the high glycemic foods in this chart that we just showed, the high glycemic foods, they spike your blood sugar. The low glycemic foods, they don't spike your blood sugar. Well, here's another example. Okay, so let's look first at you know meat veggies and butter okay top top of the top of the uh, chart here key here okay so these are these bottom ones so a couple times you know you see the bottom same so a couple times there were some spikes and crashes right it, you know it's like a roller coaster here but overall look at the chart here okay that that's what you want to see it looks a lot like that low GI that's what you see with meat, veggies, butter. So that's you know a popular you know low carb, paleo, or ketogenic meal. You know a meat with fats and, and maybe a salad. You know that's really low glycemic, high fiber, really really good. Gonna be no spike. Now if you go down to the next one, the red one, that's pasta. Okay, so look at what pasta does to your blood sugar. Not only does it raise it, but it stays elevated for a lot longer afterward. There's some other things on there, like a wrap with potatoes and salmon. I don't know why this chart doesn't go further, uh, but you know, there's some. There's two slices of bread, lots of butter and cheese, so a higher fat meal. But the bread, you know, negates it. So that's one of the. I'd say you know, maybe the worst meal on there, because it's gonna be really high calorie. You want high fat. I like the butter. I, I don't. I'm okay with the cheese, depending on the source, but. What about the bread? Get the bread out of there. Likewise with the wrap with potato and salmon. Like the salmon is probably really, really good, uh, depending on the sourcing again, but the wrap makes a huge difference. And so I'm going to show you as we move into to number four here, um, I, I'm going to talk about you know measuring. But as we're still talking about glycemic, let me look through some of my values and some of my numbers here because I have carefully, carefully tracked this and I like to see it. 
you know, so the, the highest that light ever gets is usually um, after um, a, a workout. But let's see, that's I can tell that that's an early one because I see some triple digit numbers. I've got all these uh, papers in my hand where I'm tracking my blood sugar. Uh, here's one. Uh, I woke uh, 1 p.m. I was at 90. And this is after a workout. So after a workout, oh, okay, so let's start the whole day off. I woke up, I was 80. I ate a meal, I was 85. Um, I, I then went up to 92, then went back down to 83. Then I had a workout, I went up to 105, had a shake that had 15 grams of carbs in it. Okay, we're gonna talk about measuring those carbs here in a second, uh, which is you know the, the highest carb meal of my day probably. Uh, I went to 101, then I started dropping 91, 90. Then I had a big omelet for lunch, and I went down to 87. And it went down to 82. Uh, and it continued to drop here. Had some pecans and went back up to 93. But then later in the evening, went down to 80, 74 later in the night. So it, never really a big spike there. Let me see if I can find some other post meals real quick. Oh, here's one at night, 7 o'clock at night. Uh, and I ate some meat and cheese. Okay, so here I, I went from, I was at 69, 68, 69, 66, 69. Uh, then I had an omelet. The omelet took me up to 82. Probably had some, you know, onions and, and I don't know, avocados in it. Uh, I didn't write all the details on here. Then I was at 82. Then I had some meat and cheese. Uh, went down to 78. Then I had a glass of wine and a burger. Uh, this was on a Sunday night. Went up to 88. And there's other times where, you know, a glass of wine will actually drop me down very far. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have any sugar. It just means that you know, my insulin is taking the blood sugar down. So anyway, these are just some some of my responses pre and post meal. And this is a really, really easy thing to measure and a really great segue into number four, learning how to measure yourself. Okay, so there's two things that, that you can do here. Track your carb intake for four days. I, I like saying four days. You can do it for any amount of time. Uh, even per meal, you can just kind of start looking at it, but look at how many carbs you intake for the day. Okay, and, and, and a useful tool here is to measure what's called net carbs. Okay, net carbs are your total carbs minus your fiber. Okay, so going back to a, a food label here, you see net, or there's carbs, 26 grams. There's no fiber in here. I don't see any pulp, so there's no fiber. This pouch back here had like, 0.5 grams of fiber, uh, but yeah. So say you had, go back here. Say you had, you know, 20 grams of carbs and 15 grams of fiber. That's five grams net carbs. And I go into this a little bit more detail in my uh, ebook, The Real Health Guide to the Ketogenic Diet, because it's a really important thing if you're going to follow a ketogenic diet to know how to count your carbs. And, and I'd say on a typical day for me. When I'm on a ketogenic diet, for sure, I stay under 50 grams of, of net carbs per day. Uh, you know, fairly easily. That's even when I'm not in strict ketosis. Um, to get into ketosis, you need to be under that 50, under 40, sometimes even under 30 grams of net carbs. But I would say that you know, low carb day or a good day should be under 100 grams of net carbs. Uh, sometimes they'll do studies on, on they'll call it a low carb diet, and they'll be giving the the subjects 200 grams of, of carbs. That's not a low carb diet in my opinion, but a lot of Americans, you know, looking at the USDA food pyramid, that is the base of the food pyramid, right? So that most Americans are way, way, way over their intake of carbs. So that's one way is to track it. You know, you can write it down on a piece of paper, like I got here, scraps of paper. But there are tons of apps out there. Uh, one that I really like is called Chronometer. C R. There's no H. Uh, C R O N O M E T E R. Chronometer. Uh, and there's plenty of them out there where you can type in. You know, I ate uh, a cup of spinach with a, a cup of diced chicken and uh, you know whatever a handful of pecans or whatever, and it, it just tracks your carb intake and really lets you know these numbers. And you can track it forever, right? But I'm not a huge fan of, of tracking. It's just not really my style. I'm just a little more uh, natural. But I like to track it from time to time 
so that I know how it responds. And blood sugar is one of those things that, which we're going to talk about next, that I like to track pretty much all the time because it's so unpredictable and it's crazy how you know one weekend can can change it. You know, I was at a, a friend's wedding last weekend, stood at this wedding, and coming back from from the wedding, it, completely different, uh, completely different, even with the same foods. And so things can spike your blood sugar, and it takes a while to get it back under control. Different days will have different effects. Even your, your genetics will have different effects. Your past history will have different effects. So I think it's really, really fascinating. So that is number two there, you know, measure your blood sugar. It's shockingly cheap and easy. If my camera was working, I would prick my finger right here in front of you guys and, and see where I'm at. Might do it anyway because I'm just kind of curious as I'm talking here. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's shockingly cheap and easy. So I, the, once again, this information, I go into it in more detail in my ebook, uh, The Real Health Guide to the Ketogenic Diet. So if you're watching this, this you know, webinar, you can access that through some of the links um, on our blog, on our, on our website. Um, but yeah, this, the meter that I use, I have it in front of me right now, it's called the Precision Extra. And I only recommend that meter because it measures blood sugar and ketones okay so i like to measure my ketones when i'm doing a ketogenic diet but the other beaters if you go to walmart and you go to the diabetic section and if you heard that noise that was my finger being pricked if you go to the diabetic section there is strips and there are meters and you can walk out the door with a meter and strips for about 14 bucks okay so i'm at 83 right now uh you know right right you know kind of where I stay, really, quite frankly. Uh, so 83, that, that's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, but yeah, so go to Walmart, look for a meter in the diabetic section, and, and start measuring your blood sugar. It's really, really cheap. It's really, really easy. And I, I think that you'll be fascinated by it. It's something that I recommend everybody try to do, um, even if it's just for, for a week. You know, 15 bucks could get you... Uh, I don't know how many strips you'd walk out the door with, but I mean at least 10 or 20, you know, the, the strips are fairly inexpensive. I go to Walmart and buy the knockoff strips for my Precision Extra, um, so that once again, that's the meter that I use. I got it on Amazon, uh, but the knockoff brand name is Walmart's brand name. It's called Rely On, and the strips are called the Ultima Strips. So I have a 20-pack here that I just picked up the other day. I think it was like 10 bucks, and that's their most expensive pack per strip 50 cents per strip uh, is the most expensive pack I've done things like one one weekend when I first started doing this I pricked my finger 40 times um, and, and that might sound crazy it, it kind of sounds crazy to be saying it but it was really easy it was really fun it was really cool to see my fingers didn't really hurt uh, it's not a painful thing um, so yeah go out and get a meter and measure yourself that is the number one thing you know if you know especially like let's say that you are diabetic or pre-diabetic. There, there's first off absolutely no contraindications to measuring your, your blood sugar or controlling it. In fact, it's the exact opposite. A lot of people say, well, what if I'm diabetic or, or pre-diabetic? Can I do this low-carb diet? And, and, and here's what's going to happen is you're going to reverse your diabetes. Uh, yeah, you can do it. Now, do you want to do it under the under the supervision of, of your healthcare professional if you're diabetic, if you're on insulin, if you're on metformin? Absolutely, and of course. But go and tell your doctor you want to, to reverse diabetes. What do you think they're going to say? No, I don't want you to. No, they'll absolutely support you. Um, but you have, to, you have to do your research. You have to do your homework. If you go to your doctor and say, teach me how to reverse my diabetes, they're going to look at you and say, well, metformin or what do you mean? Um, so they do not know how. That is your job. That is our job. That is what we help you with uh, is actually reversing it and giving you the, the roadmap and the action steps to do it. But with these five action steps and, and about to go into the fifth one, uh, you can absolutely take yourself from a diabetic or pre-diabetic state and, and reverse that. Okay, you can literally reverse that. It is reversible. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And I, I just so highly recommend it. Like I said, it's one of my favorite things when patients come in and, and they just got their physical and they're no longer diabetic or they're no longer pre-diabetic, especially that HbA1c number because that, that's a nine-month 
or a three month rather, uh, you know, blood sugar average. So, you know, you, your blood sugar might be 105 one day of fasting in the morning and it might be 95 the next day. So you're borderline, borderline pre-diabetic. But that HbA1c number, I love to see that one improve. So take control and, and, and do this for yourself. Uh, nobody else is going to do it for you. But, you know, once again, I, I also want to add that that is exactly why we're here uh, is to help you. So, you know, you can do a lot on your own, but, you know, you need to know which foods to eat. You need to know how to prepare them. You need to know a lot of other things, and you can do a lot on your own, but you also sometimes need coaching, uh, and that's, that's exactly where, where we come into play, or a physician like myself um, comes into play. So number five, a uh, really, really cool topic uh, is eat less often one of my favorite topics today fasting okay and so fasting you know like i said down there uh intermittent alternate day block or prolonged and i'll explain those but i would say that three meals a day is your your max okay and this is something that that would, i took from my mentor dr papa he always says don't eat less eat less often Okay, that's the most important thing that you'll you'll hear me say, uh, maybe ever. If you want to lose weight, if you want to control your blood sugar, uh, you can control your blood sugar by starving yourself, absolutely. But eventually, your body is going to know that it's starving, and when it's starving, it also stores fat. So many people have done you know calorie restriction diets where you know you're just eating less. You go from eating two thousand calories a day to eating fifteen hundred calories a day. The math. The math says that by the end of the week, by the end of the month, you should be losing weight, but you notice that, that, that that's not happening. Well, that's because calories are not everything. Calories are not everything by any means. Your hormones are, okay? And this is a way of controlling your hormones like insulin and cortisol, your fat storage hormones. So three meals a day is max. And so eating less, uh, to go back to that really quickly, Eating less in the long term, your body will know that it's starving and it will gorge back on food or it will store as fast. So you don't want to eat less, you want to eat less often. Okay, so three meals a day is max. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I would say that if you go less than that, go less than that. Two big meals a day is great. That's what's called intermittent fasting. And here's just a really quick first step is stop eating between meals. Stop snacking. Uh, if you go back to these charts, let's say you eat a big meal and then you snack. You're doing a, a big spike, then a dip, and then another spike. And one of these other charts just kind of showed it a little bit better. Um, yeah, so excess insulin tra triggers, a, a cra triggers a sugar craving. But then if you throw another little bump in there, that would be a snack. Let me get back to this. Um, so don't eat between meals, don't snack, just keep it at your meals, keep them nice and big, it has some good fats, has some low carbs, um, and then you're, you're going to be able to go longer. Now that's going to be really hard at first because you are trained to be a sugar burner. So let me go back to the metaphor of throwing wood on the fire. Okay, so say that you're, you have a wood burning stove or you have a fireplace that heats your house. Okay, and, and, and so your metabolism is a lot like that. And when you throw kindling, say you have a wood burning stove and you throw a bunch of twigs in there, well, they're gonna spark up really quickly, but they're gonna die out really quickly too. So what do you gotta do? You gotta go back and throw more on. And then 10 minutes later, go back and throw more on. Then 10 minutes later, go back and throw more on. That is most of us right now. That is when you are a sugar burner. That is when you have poor blood sugar control. Your blood sugar spikes and crashes, poor blood sugar control. Now, when you throw a big log on there, that's more of your high fat diet. Those logs can burn for a really long time. Okay, so you should be able to go easily in between meals without being hungry. You should probably be able to go, you know, Eight, 16, 18, 24 hours and without being hungry um, if you have good blood sugar control. Um, so don't eat in between meals is the very first step 
to controlling that. Then the next step is maybe doing something like fasting. Now, once again, I, I don't encourage just going out and doing this on your own. Uh, a great book is out there now. It's by uh, Dr. Fung, Dr. Jason Fung is an MD, and Jimmy Moore, who is uh, you know some some uh, people that I'm very in tune with that that do the ketogenic diet and they do fasting, and they're they're heavily related because when you fast, your body's going to produce ketones. Uh, so when your blood sugar drops low enough and your insulin is suppressed long enough, your body's going to start burning fat. And that is what's called ketogenesis. It's ketogenic or ketosis is the state that it's called. So once again, you know, I keep talking about that. So, so download my, my ebook if you want to know about that. But even if you're not going into ketosis, intermittent fasting is a huge thing that you can do. So what that means is go 16 to 18 hours in between meals. And, and that's what I recommend. Dr. Mercola calls it peak fasting because what he does is looks at your blood sugar, looks very specifically at your blood sugar, and looks at it. if it continues to dip, 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 that's good. But if it starts to rise, that's the time that you start eating. So let me give you an example of intermittent fasting. Let's say you eat dinner at 7 o'clock at night. Uh, then you stop for the rest of the night. Okay, You don't eat any more after your dinner. And you give your body a 16 to 18 hour window where you're fasting. Okay, so what that might look like is if you ate dinner at 7 o'clock, maybe you go until 11 o'clock the next day. That would be a 16-hour fast. So you go from 7 p.m., you skip breakfast. That's the most common way of intermittent fasting. You can do, uh, there, there's several different ways. I actually have a podcast episode that, that talks about all the different ways. So once again, download that on the website if you want to, to listen about intermittent fasting. But give yourself a 16-hour window. Now, sometimes for women, 14-hour window works better. You, the, the, the key is to know yourself and to know your body. Uh, and the best way to do that is to measure your blood sugar. But yeah, you should be able to go 14, 16, 18 hours in between meals, and that's called intermittent fasting. Why this is so magical, what it's been shown to do, there's a study that showed that in men, it boosted HGH, or human growth hormone, by 2,000%. Okay, that's a massive spike. HGH is an anti-aging hormone. It is, you know, muscle building and fat burning. Uh, one of the most important hormones that, that we can boost. And it boosted it 2,000%, which is astronomical. In women, it boosted it 1,300%. And I have absolutely had patients that have plateaued on their weight loss. You know, they they lose a, a little or a lot, you know, really. Uh, 20, 30 pounds, but then they kind of plateau and they get hung up. They'll do a, they'll start intermittent fasting, or they'll do a block fast, which I'll talk about here in a second. And all of a sudden, the weight starts coming off again. So fasting is a great way to not only take control of your blood sugar, but really continue your your weight loss, continue muscle building. You know, a lot of uh, uh, bodybuilders and things will even do intermittent fasting for the HGH benefits. Another one that I that I love, um, which is I would say that I've put these in order of easiest to hardest and of beginner to expert. Uh, intermittent fasting you can start with. Start by skipping breakfast. Okay, that's how you do it. Skip breakfast. Go to work hungry. You might feel like you're gonna die the first day. You know, maybe low carb it for a week first, um, so so that you just get used to not running on, on high sugar, and then start skipping breakfast. Um, and, and that's intermittent fasting. Eat your first meal at 11, 12, 1 in the afternoon. Alternate day fasting would be the next step. Uh, alternate day fasting is exactly like it sounds like. Alternate days of eating. Eat Monday, don't eat Tuesday. Eat Wednesday, don't eat Thursday. Eat Friday. Now what they've shown with this, a lot of this research is coming out of the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, and what they've shown with this is you might think that by skipping a day that you're going to gorge the, the next day and you're just going to binge, right? And maybe some people do at the beginning, first day. But what they found is that they, people don't. They typically keep their intake about the same as a normal day, even after skipping a day. The weight loss results with this have been phenomenal. So even if you started with that, like let's say you, you eat Monday, skip Tuesday, fast Tuesday, 
eat Wednesday, fast Thursday, two days a week, fast Tuesday and Thursday, that's going to be great for your blood sugar and great for your weight loss right away. Now, once again, you don't want to eat less. You want to eat less often. So you will eat a little bit more on your Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but you're not going to gorge yourself. You're not going to binge. Maybe you still do an intermittent fasting on those days. Dr. Papa uh, teaches a, a rule called the 5 one, one rule, which is five days of intermittent fasting, one day of full fasting. So maybe you go dinner to dinner on a Wednesday, and one day of feasting, one day of kind of carb loading. And it doesn't mean like pizza, ice cream, pasta. It just means you, know, you eat your healthy plant-based paleo diet, um, and, and you get more carbs than what you might have on, on some of your lower carb days. But you feast. You don't limit yourself. You let your body know that it's not starving. Okay, now block fasting is the next one. That is doing a few days at a time. What I strongly recommend is four days because when you do two and you do three, they're great for you. But usually those are the days that you kind of feel bad. And a lot of people will say on the fourth day that something happened on that fourth day and that fourth day is really magic and they start feeling great. And that's when their ketones start to rise and blood sugar has been consistently down enough that they really start to feel good. And I, I've had people oftentimes make it to day four and they'll continue on because they feel so good. They're like, oh, why, do I, why, why do I go back? You know, I, I'll keep going. I'll go seven days. I'll go eight days. There's a lot of things that you can do for this blocked and prolonged fasting. Once again, you know, work with me, work with a healthcare practitioner. I'm, I'm not encouraging anybody based on this webinar to just go out and, and stop eating, um, even though you, I mean, you absolutely can. I, I shouldn't say that, but you know, be smart about it. If you're diabetic or, uh, you, you know, I'm just saying that as a disclaimer, but you're probably pretty good. But especially a diabetic, you know, work with your, your practitioner if you have a diagnosed condition. Let me, let me say that for sure. Um, but block or prolong, you can do things like a water fast. Uh, we, we always we encourage people to do bone broth, bone broth fasting, bone stock. You know, you can do chicken, you can do goat, you can do, or uh, yeah, you can do beef broth. Uh, and so my wife has done several uh, block fasts, uh, like four days, five days of, of water or of bone broth. You could also do whey water. Uh, one that I really like is called a uh, Suero, Suero Gold, Suero Vive Cleanse. Uh, you can type that in or you can type it Beyond Organic, but you can get a whey water fast. It's about $75 for, for three days. The, the one thing that I will say with this is this is not juice fasting, okay? Because we're talking about blood sugar here, and that is the, the, the biggest problem that I have with juicing is that it is spiking your blood sugar. So, it, you know, you may have heard of it for cancer or for other things, you know, going on a juice fast, 30-day juice fast or things like that. And, and if you're in dire straits, that might be warranted. But for the most part, these are v not a lot of sugar at all. So let's take bone broth, for example. Four-day bone broth fast. That means that you're not replacing your meals with the amount of calories from bone broth. It just means throughout the day you're sitting on it. That's great for gut healing. It's great for uh, collagen and connective tissues, protein source, really, really good with vitamins, minerals, nutrients. And once again, you know, you can hear about this in our in our gut health webinar. We talk about bone broth fasting quite a bit, or we also have an article on our blog, Bone Broth, uh, the amazing benefits of it. But that's an example of a block fast doing four days. A prolonged fast would be something going longer. Okay, so people do this for spiritual reasons. People do this for health reasons. Um, you know, the Bible says it's not if you fast, it's when you fast. So it's a very biblical principle. This is an ancient, an ancient healing strategy uh, that has been around for you know thousands and thousands of years. People going into fasting on purpose. You know, animals instinctively fast when they're injured or they're sick. Okay, so fasting is not something new. Um, even though it's becoming more and more popular, it's something that, that's been around forever. But prolonged fasting. I have a patient who has gone 28 days, okay, and I'm not encouraging on water. I'm not encouraging you to, to, to do that necessarily. Um, but, you know, she, she only lost eight pounds. She's very thin, but she felt amazing. 
Okay. And she's also done 13 days. I've had patients go eight days, 10 days, seven days, uh, all, basically every, every variety, not, 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 nobody else has gone 28 days. Uh, but at one point her blood sugar was so low that, you know, she would have gone to the hospital or something. They would have admitted her and it said, you're about to go into a diabetic coma, but her ketone levels were so high when blood sugar drops, ketones rise, her ketone levels were so high that she actually felt amazing those days. Okay. So she didn't lose a lot of weight. She stayed healthy. She, uh, you know, kept her electrolytes high. You know, there's a smart way to fast. So when you get into intermittent and alternate day, you, those, you pretty much have a green light to go ahead and, and try those block or prolonged fasting. You want to know a little bit more about your body and about what you want to do. Uh, but you can also do prolonged fasting where you, you know, instead of uh, eating nothing or drinking just water, you limit your calories to 500 calories a day, things like that. You know, Daniel fast that is really popular uh, in, in the church world um, and, and really, really cool and, and beneficial. So I really like to combine the, the, the teachings of these with the spiritual benefits uh, of restricting yourself from food, uh, but also the health benefits too. And there's people out there like, for example, Dr. Thomas Seyfried out of Boston University, or maybe it's Boston College. I think it's Boston University. Uh, I think he's also out of Yale. Uh, but he's written the book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. And, and he says something, you know, I'm not quoting it exactly here, but something along the lines of, if everybody would do a seven day water fast once a year, they would kill off all, all the precancerous cells, you know, majority of the precancerous cells in their body and limit their risk of cancer considerably. So fasting is a great way. And if your you know, blood sugar is, is just really dysregulated and it's just really high, maybe this is a, even a good place to start. But once again, talk to me, work with, with somebody. But uh, I'll, I'll end on this. My favorite uh, concept, it, it's such a common sense concept, is the concept of if I put you on a deserted island, you're not going to die. Even if you're pre-diabetic, even if you're diabetic, if you're full-blown, you know, bad diabetic, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting it by any means. But if I put you on a deserted island, said I'll be back in two weeks. Here's a bunch of water and nothing else. You would absolutely survive. And not only would you survive, but when I came and picked you up, you would no longer be diabetic. Okay, you'd no longer be pre-diabetic. So this is something that I encourage everybody to, to do. Start slow, okay? Start with the five action steps. Start by counting your carbs. Start by measuring your blood sugar. Start by learning glycemic index and glycemic load. Start by learning. Don't start by, by not eating. Uh, but work your way into this. Get the book uh, on fasting by Dr. Fug and, and, and uh, Jimmy Moore. Learn about this. Work with a health coach. Work with myself. Uh, real health coaching, but get your blood sugar under control because not only are, are you counting on it, you know, for a long, healthy life, but everybody else in your life is counting on it too. If you want to you know, die early and, and leave your family and your loved ones and your, your purpose and your mission, um, by all means, you know, it's your, it's your health. Take control of it though. I know that nobody really wants that for themselves. And this is one of the quickest easiest things to control, but also one of the most important. So as always, this is Dr. Taylor Crick uh, for the Real Health Resource and another Real Health webinar on blood sugar. And you feel free to send me an email if you have any questions on this. It's Dr. Taylor, no period, D-R-T-A-Y-L-O-R at realhealthresource.com. Uh, feel free to send an email over. And otherwise, check out www.realhealthresource.com for more uh, webinars, more podcasts, blog articles, so that you can really uh, you know, learn this stuff and take control of your real health. Thank you.